Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome members and guests to the open forum of the Extension Foundation's National Project Team, Community, Local and Regional Food Systems. Um, this open forum is being recorded and it will be shared on our listserv. The recording will be shared on our listserv, the website and our Facebook page. I'm Katie Hines. Um, I provide media outreach and administrative services for CLRFS. I'm based in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and work part-time at the School of Human Environmental Sciences in the Dale Bumpers College of Ar Agricultural Food and Life Sciences at the University of Arkansas. And CLRFS is led by Dr. Kathleen Leong. Dr. Leong is a W.K. Kellogg Distinguished Professor of Sustainable Agriculture and the Director of the Center for Environmental Farming Systems in the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. The Extension Foundation partners with the Cooperative Extension System, working together to increase system capacity with improving programmatic services. The foundation helps cooperative extension professionals find innovative ways to generate greater local impact through nationally funded programs made possible by member dollars and cooperative agreements with federal agencies and through partnering on state, regional, and national initiatives. The foundation provides professional development to cooperative extension professionals and offers exclusive services to its members. The foundation is an educational partner with over 50 land grant universities in the United States, but serves all land grant universities, regardless of membership status. CLRFS is an extension foundation national project team. The national project teams are multi-institutional, multi-state and multi-discipline disciplinary, bringing the best of the best educational resources to the public. Our CLRFS national project team goal is to put knowledge to action. We share resource materials and training opportunities and foster peer interactions for extension educators, community-based practitioners, and individuals involved in work related to building sustainable, equitable, and just food systems. We are comprised of over 400 extension professionals, university researchers, and food system practitioners from across the country. Some resources for members include our Facebook page and our website. CLRFS receives WordPress support through the Extension Foundation to host our website. Funding for the hosting is supported in part by the new technologies for Ag Extension Cooperative Agreement with, the, with USDA NEFA. Our website is a constant work in progress, and I would like to encourage everyone to contact me with content. I can upload research results or link to your projects and pages. The website address is foodsystems.extension.org. On Facebook, you can search for community, local, and regional food systems. And finally, our current primary resource for members is the Google Group Listserv. You can contact me if you aren't already on it um, to be added to the Google Group just email me at kdw at uark.edu. That's k-a-t-i-e-w at uark.edu. Now, before I introduce the quarterly open forum topic and our presenters, we wanted to share some upcoming opportunities. North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University is hosting the National Conference on Next Generation Sustainable Technologies for Small Scale Producers, September 7th through 9th in Greensboro, North Carolina. This conference creates a roadmap for developing and delivering the next generation of soil, air, and water technologies in support of sustainable production systems on small and limited resource farms, identifying identify gaps, needs, and recommendations for NEPA, and ensure access to technology with consideration for affordability and applic applicability. <laughs> Dr. Leong will be delivering a technical presentation on small business innovations in agriculture. Researchers are invited to submit abstracts for presentations. The deadlines are listed here, and there will be an opportunity to submit full papers after the conference. Full papers will be peer reviewed and published in the conference proceedings. Next, the Agriculture and Applied Economics Association annual meeting is July 31st through August 7th, 2nd, sorry. Um, AAEA is a non not-for-profit association serving the professional interests of members working in agricultural and broadly related fields of applied economics. 
The keynote speaker for this event is Shefali Mehta. I'm not sure about the pronunciation. Um, she's the USDA Department, uh, USDA Deputy Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics. And then the Urban Food Symposium, Food System Symposium, um, in when is it September? Um, this event will bring together a national and international audience of academic and research oriented professionals to share and gain knowledge on how we can build coalitions to adapt to this changing world and how urban food systems contribute to these solutions. Then the Food Systems Leadership Network, um, they are having an event in a few days in Canby, Oregon, uh, with just a small part of their membership. But later in the fall, they're going to have an all a free one day event that will be held virtually to discuss the outputs of the June event and to brainstorm on the direction of the network and create space to have big picture conversations around the state of the food system. And the Food Distribution Research Society will be held, a uh, conference will be held concurrently with the National Agricultural Marketing Summit this year in October. You can check the, the website for the websites there listed there for updates on those. Um, the local and regional food systems response to COVID resource hub is hosting its net, next monthly webinar next Friday. The topic is looking ahead at innovations and programs targeting local and food, local and regional supply chains. And finally, there is a call for articles for the Frontiers and Sustainable Food Systems Journal. And one of our founding members, Kim Nualny at Virginia Tech is an editor of this journal. And along with her Virginia Tech colleagues, Max Stevenson and Laura Zanotti, as well as Anna Irwin of the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Phew, now that's out of the way and we can get on with our open forum. Today's topic focuses on technology and urban agriculture. And we're happy to have with us presenters today from around the country. We have Alyssa McKim from North Carolina, Nadine Jackson from Vermont, Mengyi Dong, hopefully, uh, will be here from Illinois, and Rob Benetton from California. Each researcher will present their project, and then we'll have a Q&A session and discussion at the end. So first, we will hear from Alyssa at North Carolina Agriculture and Technical State University. Welcome, Alyssa. Thank you, Katie. Oof, that's yeah. a lot of talking. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for all that information. Um, it was, that was great. I am happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Leong, for inviting me here. I work at Cooperative Extension at AT State University, as Katie said, and I am the statewide community garden coordinator. So I'll be discussing, um, yeah, our community garden program for the state. Yeah, so this is essentially um, what my program is about at a &T. When I started here about three and a half years ago, the uh, program wasn't really established. I have a background in um, local food systems and have done trainings and, and that is sustainable or generative um, food systems is my passion. So I was able to incorporate that into the program. So. Um, and also when I first did, when I first started working and did the needs assessment with community gardens, um, we often notice, or we often think they don't survive or they, you know, they start and then they, they kind of fade out. And some of the issues that I saw were they don't have, um, many gardens don't have resources to, um, or access to resources. And they uh, also lack the, the leadership um, idea or the community part of it or the people part of gardening is which is what I say. In extension, we have a lot of technical um, know how and, and experience, but um, like the people part of the garden is really what trips um, trips us up because it can be really hard um, to work so closely with a lot of different types of people. And so that's really what my program is about. And it is um, designed to be collaborative and place-based. So what that means is that even though I serve the state, um, I work with our agents, which we have an agent in every county, every hundred, it's a hundred or 101 counties in North Carolina. And then I also work with a community leader. 
another thing I've heard is that uh, the community leaders were having a hard time accessing extension. And so by integrating both those elements or both those entities into the program, um, my hope has been, and somewhat successfully it has worked um, to really connect the you know, extension with the people at the ground level. I can go ahead and change. So one of the, um, this is just a basic slide. So one of the big parts of um, building, what I do is building the network in North Carolina. There are a lot of community gardens and uh, North Carolina Community Garden Partners was, um, is an advisor committee that was started many years ago um, by a grant. And so it was grant funded and you know it has had a long history and story, which I won't get into. But a part of what I wanted to do is to bolster that um, network up again and kind of revive it. So I received a grant from Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation in North Carolina. And a large part of that was to um, enliven this new network again. So North Carolina Community Garden Partners, this is our new Lego logo, and we have a brand new website that um, attach it that can uh, people go to and it has lots of resources, but it also has a link to our statewide online network. And that has been really uh, interesting to start. It has it's kind of you know started and stopped, but it's really flowing now. It takes a lot of energy, as I'm sure we all know, to really get um, new ideas flowing and to build out um, to build out networks to get people pumped and excited about things. But now um, people are on it on a daily basis and they this is a place, a platform for gardeners to share ideas, have questions, educational opportunities, grant opportunities, job opportunities. It's all on this um, on this platform. And people can even get a little more nuanced by um, putting in their region. So if they live in the eastern part of the state, they can really focus you know, their questions to those folks. Or in the western part of the state, they can really um, focus those questions to those folks. Um, so that was that's one element of what we do. I wouldn't be able to do it by myself. I mean, being a statewide community or a garden coordinator or statewide anything, is just it's like a tall order so um, with community garden partners um, it's an advisory group as i said of community gardeners throughout the state and if you see the next slide i borrowed this um, map or this image from um, an economic um, network that is in north carolina and i borrowed it because i loved how they broke up the regions and this is how we broke up the regions, North Carolina Community Garden Partners. So we have at least one advisory um, board member, advisory committee member from each region. And um, I'm shooting now for my trainings. At first I was wanted to do a training in each of these regions. It's very ambitious. So I've kind of broadened those, um, those regions, but this is kind of where we're, where we're, where we're starting and our idea is to create hubs of knowledge in each of these regions because a lot of community gardens, um, they feel isolated. Even if even in urban environments or even in our urban counties, they still, they don't know what other community gardens are doing and um, they feel really isolated a lot of the time. So this is a way to connect folks. You can go to the next slide. So a part of my program is the Community Garden Leadership Academy. And this is a training that I developed, again, to reiterate that place-based knowledge um, and collaboration. And so what it is do, what it does, and this is also, so it's regionally based training, and I partner with the agent and a community leader, and the three of us will facilitate, will plan and facilitate a two and a half day training for community gardeners um, in that area. Now it does not focus on horticulture, pest management and all that jazz. It focuses on community development and community engagement. Again, the people part of gardening. Um, 
I really am a firm believer that, and this is one of the part, reasons I love my job is because of that intersection between community development and agriculture. Um, one of the things that always holds us up or catches us, yeah, holds us up from really uh, making change is the fact that we can't accept other people. Um, we can't accept ourselves. We don't know how to work through conflict. And um, so that's a big part of this training. And I believe that's a big part of leadership in general. Um, and so that is where I focus my energy. Next slide. These are some past trainings. On the left is um, Joni Torres. She is this amazing community gardener, eastern part of the state. She's been doing this for years. Uh, this was during COVID. This was our only COVID training. It was primarily online, but we went to her garden, um, which was such a relief during that time to be able to go to that garden. The Scent Morning Me is just doing, showing folks about soil, doing soil samples. And then the one on the right is in um, is a community leader talking about their garden and their work in Guilford County. Next. So I have done five trainings. One of those was virtual. I've done it in three regions representing 12 counties and 32 garden leaders have completed that training. They, rece they receive a certificate and, um, and then also I haven't done them. I haven't done the numbers, but I know a majority of like, I would say close to 80% of those folks are on the online network and have stayed connected um, with each other and, and working together. Can you go next? And the other part of my job is the community, Aggie Community Garden. Um, this is a community garden on the, I have two, we have two community gardens. One is on the farm the a and State University Farm, which is this big, huge, beautiful farm. And we have this little piece of the student community farm. And at that, um, in that little parcel, we have developed a community garden. And we have 11 people there now. And then this year, every year changes. So it's, developed, it's grown. This is the third year. Actually, this is the second full year because we started it and then COVID hit. And so we grew the food and donated it. Last year was the first year, and then this year we have 11 people, and then we have a perennial demo garden that's um, pollinators, and then a cut flower garden. And this garden is used for demonstration for our agents throughout the state. It has a um, universal design aspect to, to it, so that's um, an area where people with different abilities can come in and it's very easy to access. Um, we also have other really cool um, parts of this garden to be able to show folks um, best practices. And then we also have a community garden that I have partnered with the Student Health Center on campus. And that's been a joy to uh, help those folks who have no experience growing, but just such a passion for um, uh, healthy food and food access. And so it's been a joy to support them in that. Next slide. And this is just the beginning of the um, what we started with, which wasn't much. And then you can next slide. And this is actually last year, so not the best photos, but it's a totally different, um, totally different vibe there now. And even now, that left-hand photo, um, it's transformed even more, even more. So it's in constant transformation, and it's a joy to be out there. And this is in Greensboro. Um, it's about five minutes from the city center, which is in the center of North Carolina. Next slide. So this, um, actually I'm gonna drop in the chat because I have last, this is the kind of the last thing I've been doing. And um, the last general thing I've been doing, let's say that. I essentially um, travel and serve the state, but these are like the big highlights. And this is a link, um, I'm going to drop it in the chat, as I said, to a publication that I just that just came out online and uh, paper copies will be available next week. And it's called Community Fresh. It's a community garden startup guide, again, focusing on the people part of gardening. So really walking through people, walking people through how to start a garden, organizing, bringing people in. 
um, like the, you know, fundraising, all of that sort of thing, even site selection. The first part is just reading. And then the second part is a toolkit. So there's printables and uh, folks have the ability to use that in their, like tangibly use that. Yeah. That's next slide. Uh, these are the upcoming trainings that we have going on and to open to the public, the community garden training um, at the student community farm is coming up, I believe it's in July, but still to be determined. We have ongoing monthly workshops. You can find them at the nccgp.org website. And then I'm gonna have an Eastern CGLA and a Western um, Community Garden Leadership Academy in the fall. Next slide. Okay. That was it. Oh, that's it. So my last slide had my information on it, but um, I will drop my info in the chat. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share um, a little about our program here at North Carolina A&T. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, she may not be able to stick around for um, our Q&A session. So if does anyone have any questions for Alyssa right now? Okay. I had a question. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, are, are we able to access the, the guide that she talked about and the toolkit? Yes, so I had dropped that link in the um, chat. I'm also gonna put my information in the chat as well. And if you're having a hard time accessing it for some reason, then um, you can just email me or call me and I'll make sure that you personally get that. Um, okay, thank you so much. Yeah, and just real quick, Raul had a question. Uh, I didn't go into the detail of the, the grant, and I know I don't have much time. I'm sorry, I'm going over. Um, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation grant, what I did with that uh, is that we, we did lots of subgrants or stipends. We had three rounds of different stipends for community gardens to apply for um, that these were stipends primarily in tier one uh, counties for folks who ha didn't have as many resources as others. And then once you go through the leadership academy, then you get access to a larger stipend opportunity. So it's all intertwined and, and I didn't get into that part, but thank you for asking that question. Again, I'll, if you have any more questions, just let me know. I'll put my information in the chat. Okay. Um, looks like Kimberly Holmes had something in the chat too. Are you coaching any community gardens that are totally managed and funded by community slash neighborhood groups? I, yes, um, there are not necessarily coaching them. I am supporting them, yeah, supporting them as needed. And, and, a, few, and a few have been in the training, not a few, most of them are, uh, most of the people who attend the training are community led, community funded. Okay. Um, Nadine, are you ready? Yes. Can you see my, my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nadine Jackson. I am a program and grants coordinator at the Small Farms Outreach Program. And I'm also the, um, the PI for the, the, with the trust group for the um, 1890s um, Center for Excellence project. So today I'm going to share with you. Um, let's see. There we go. I'm going to share with you about what we're doing at Virginia State University and about the, the resource center that we have put in place. And to start, this is just a picture view of the farm. This is the um, 416 acres of um, at the Randall Farm location. And my office is actually located at this site. Um, about us, meaning the Small Farms Outreach Program, this program was established in 1986 as a pilot project with just five staff. And um, it became a program in 1991. And since then, it has grown to 27 staff. And these 27 staff pretty much assist small beginning socially disadvantaged farmers all across Virginia. And we also um, 
assist some farmers in the bordering areas of North Carolina and also of Maryland. The mission of this program is to provide outreach, training, and technical assistance to small, limited resource, social disadvantaged veterans and beginning farmers and ranchers. This is a territories map that um, shows the various areas. And we share this with all of our participants so that they can know where they, um, their program assistant is located, how to reach them, who works in their area, and also contact information for them to, to reach us. And we do have um, a program that we call the um, New Farmers Orientation. And then this program, we kind of give the, the, the beginning farmers a walkthrough of how to connect to various agencies whether it's um, USDA or soil and water conservations, and we connect them to the ones that are in their particular areas. Um, we have a number of partners. I've listed them here, which I'll share. I'll show you more um, towards the end when I share our resource center page. And pretty much we have um, about 19 cooperative um, agreements and grant funds combined together that we, um, we have various projects that we do um, run currently. And these are just a few of the individuals who we partner with. And the goal is to pro provide a holistic program for the, the um, farmers that we serve. This is a picture of our uh, most recent um, project is the mobile education unit where we have been um, taking it to various schools, universities, state fairs, and it's like everyone wants it. So it's it's in high demand right now. And it travels, you can, what um, on the inside, we have the various enterprises and the histories and different games that um, interactive activities within that you can play. And um, when I say play, just interact and you can learn something about the various enterprises that are um, in Virginia. Um, the other new project we have in place is the high tunnel. It's an automated high tunnel. It's off the grid. And this tunnel, it's, um, if you can see here, we have solar panels that are used to power uh, the generators and so forth. And um, we have tomatoes, we have, peppers and various um, produce that we grow within. And um, I believe last year we had over um, 150 pounds of, of potato, of um, tomatoes, but we distribute those out to the, um, to the food banks and so forth. And with this project here, we, we are educating farmers about high tunnels. They might not be able to use um, the, you know, they might not be able to do an automated one similar to this, but at least we can teach them the various um, factors that deals with setting up a high tunnel, how to plant, how to um, rotate the crops inside and so forth. And we also do a little project where we have some of the similar things that are going on the inside on the outside. So which, you know, we are actually doing a project where we can show what it's like on the inside and how much it yields and you know those variables that are in place. Um, the other thing is the mobile processing unit. This is a unit that is um, led out by Dr. Um, Dahlia O'Brien. She deals with the small ruminants. And this is a processing unit. She also has a certification program that she's doing um, that's also in high demand. And with this project here, they train the producers on how to handle the meats, how to process it, how to package and all of those things with this unit. Um, the next thing that I wanna share is that we have a newsletter, which we, we put in place during the COVID season because we realized there are a lot of farmers who are having trouble getting information. So with this newsletter, the program assistants take it to the farmers into their communities and distribute it to them. And in the, you, the um, we have tips for them, we share, current information that um, they can be aware of what resources that are available to producers. Um, this is a snapshot of some of the flyers of the events that we do. We have 
between 60 and up, 60 and fit, um, 80 events each quarter. So we have a whole lot of um, events that we have concurrently going on always um, at the smartphones program. This is a snapshot of what's happening in the field. We have training workshops, we have demonstrations, and also um, um, field days where the team members, the, pro the program assistants go out. We, after we distributed our flyers and let them know what's upcoming, they can go out and individuals can register online and be, be um, able to attend these events. Here's just some more demonstrations where we're showing individuals how to actually do certain things like this one at the bottom is a field day. The other one is a potato digging demonstration. And we also have the, um, these equipments that we share with our farmers so that they can see how to use them. We show them how to um, start it up, how to you know, move it from one area to the next and how to utilize that to maximize their, their operation. And this is just another picture of showing this is a, um, a group of youths who gain hands-on experience for, for during the, the spring and summer season. This is an, a photo of our conference. We have conferences. Um, I'm sorry, my slide is moving. <laughs> we have conferences and this, these are individuals who are awarded um, for the work that they, you know, they did in the community. This slide shows Mr. Um, Dr. McKenney. Dr. McKenney, I wanted to recognize him today because this is his last month. Um, he's retiring. And the, the resource center that I'm about to show you, he was, um, this was under his leadership. So I wanted to recognize him for his um, part in making sure that this program and this service is available to the farmers that we serve. And this small farm center, it was developed, it was designed for Virginia small farmers with a single, um, it's as a place for them to come to get information and resources to help them. And um, we received funding from the Department of Health and Community Development and the Virginia Small Farm Outreach Program also was very, um, intricate in making sure that this thing came together. So with that, I'm going to click on this slide and to this link. Let me. Okay, can everyone, see, can you see this, the resource center page? Are you able to see it? Okay. Okay, so. I wanted to show um, real quick at the bottom of this page, it has different featured items and the featured articles and items that you see, those are put are pasted here. Nadine, we're looking at the first slide, your first slide. Is that what we should be looking at? No, let me, let me try this. Let me stop for a minute. Thank you for letting me know that. Okay, here we go. All right, are you seeing um, the resource center page? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so on this page, this is the, gen the, um, the Small Farms Resource Center. And on this page, one of the features that I wanted to introduce to you is, the, is this um, 1890s, university tab on this field here. I have a little delay, I'm sorry. So pretty much we have everything listed here, meaning that all of the events that were posted here by um, different individuals. So we have a share button where you or any of the 1890s university can share an event that they may have coming up. Like um, Dr. Um, Liang sent me a, a couple of um, information and they're listed here. Once I receive them, we paste it here so that the, our community can know, hey, this is going on at, at um, say NCAT. This is what's happening here. And believe it or not, as a result of that, we're having a bus go to this event um, that's coming up. So 
the goal is for us to share what we're doing amongst the 1890s universities and um, cooperative extension so you guys can know what's happening. And then our farmers can come to your events and they can learn different methods, different techniques, and also for us to collaborate with, with each other as well. So, and the programs are also, let's see, say the farmer comes and they want to check out what's happening in um, Carolina State University, they can click here and they'll be able to go directly to their site and pull up their information and, you know, check it out and see what's going on there. So the goal here is for us to have to create that collaboration amongst each other. Okay. And just to show you a few more things about this site, we have an events calendar that is also linked to the cooperative extension um, at VSU. And here you can just click on any event that we have listed and it will pull up the flyer and the registration link for whatever um, workshops we have coming up. If it's a Zoom, you know, you can attend. If it's a distant one, you can always schedule to have your um whoever you, you know, your farmers come and attend as well. Okay, and this, um, if you click on this link, it drops down all of the various areas that we have. We have agriculture, forestry, the greenhouse, ham, marketing and agribusiness, the small farm outreach program, which is my program, the food and um, vegetables, small ruminants. If you click on any of them, Let's see, sustainable agriculture. You know, it will bring you to their page and it will show you the various activities that they're doing, okay? So pretty much that's, um, that's it as far as what I wanted to share with you. I wanted you guys to know that this is available to you. You can go to SFOP Partners. This shows you all of our partners that we have which I mentioned earlier, and you can click on the link and you know the farmers can get information about any of them. What is agribility, um, Brunswick Farms and Family, Department of Conservation, Farm Credit, Minority Veterans, Farmers of Piedmont, all of these programs actually work with us. And when our program assistants um, prepare or, or conduct a workshop, they usually invite individuals depending on what's going on. Um, for the military veterans, we just had a field day. We had a um, hundred, um, about 130 participants who attended. And this, this was just the veterans. And they were so overwhelmed by the amount of information that they received. And they were so grateful. I, I, I've been receiving emails and um, um, with gratitudes of how grateful they were for that event that was just for, for them. Um, so the, the, the 1890s link, if any of you want to share information on our site, you just go to the, to the 1890s university page and where it says 1890s share, you will click on that. And you can select just your university. But currently I only have a few because this was done this was set up. It's a Qualtrics. Um, it's a Qualtrics template that I used to do this, and it was set up just for the five universities that were in our um, our thrust. And pretty much what we did, we did a pilot with that, just to see how well it works. And they were able to share. They provided the topic, the event date, the location. If it's a Zoom. You can paste a Zoom link right there. And then you put your contact information and any more details that you have about your event, flyers, you can paste the link right there. And that's what I received from um, those three events that you saw earlier. I received the link and I copied it, sent it to the, the gentleman that who sets up our page and he was able to post it. And then a, just a brief survey at the end to let us know whether you, know, you thought this was a, a um, a useful tool. So we, um, this is the share. Yes, this is the 1890s university shares. You can use that to share information. 
And that's pretty much it. Um, does anyone have any questions or any feedback suggestions? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Next, we have uh, Meng Yi from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. Are you there? Hi, I'm, th I'm here. Hi, there you are. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, let me share my Thank screen you. again. I'm so encouraged to see so many like farm outreaches. Oh, during my master's, I actually live in Virginia for two years, and oh. I used to do community outreach in the education, nutrition education, and food safety education. It's really good to see Virginia folks here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. I'll, I'll advance your slides whenever you tell me. Okay, thank you. So today, mine is a little bit technical, and I will introduce you a risk assessment tool using the food safety practice survey and next generation sequencing. And I have this practice in the hydroponic and aquaponic farm in Chicago area. And next slide, please. So if some of you are not familiar with hydroponics, it's a uh, soilless gardening. And there are two terms. One is hydroponic farming, which use the nutrient solution as the nutrient supply for the plants. Another term is aquaponic farming, which you raise fish and the plants together in one system and use the fish waste as a nutrient supply for the plants. And both of them using circulation water in the system and it's in a greenhouse controlled environment. Usually it's operated by small farms. And for that, um, next page, please. Um, Mengyu, could you me. speak There's up? Okay, I was getting yeah. ready to say the same thing, Katie, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you could speak up a little or speak closer to the microphone. Sure. So it's in a more in a closed greenhouse environment compared with traditional field farming, which has many sources of outside um, contaminations. Hydroponic farming system look more health, healthy or safer. However, there might be some food safety or other risks. And there is a animation, please click. <laughs> uh, would you please click? Yes, another click. <laughs> so it's also very important to know what are the food safety risks there? So if contamination happens, it's possibly will multiply in the system. And next slide, please. So our idea is, uh, would you please click through it? <laughs> we want to have a first need to know the bacterial community, microbial profiling in the system. And another click, please. And we want to know what kind of hazard are there in the system. And next click. And based on that, we also want to know what is the hazard transmission map inside the system and how we can prevent that. And next click. So based on this idea, we need to develop a food safety practice survey to understand the operation. And next one is we need to do sampling and measure the microbial profile inside the system. And here we use next generation sequencing and bioinformatics. And next slide, please. So for the hydroponic system operation, they usually start in the small blocks and transmit to like larger system in the tubing or in the deep water system. And another click. And here are the possible risks. One is contaminated seeds coming from the outside. And now the one can be the circulation of the nutrient solution. Another two is the source of water as well as the personnel who's working inside the farm. And would you please click through? For each part of it, there will be their own bacterial profile. So each kind of bacteria has its own function like the bacteria in our gut. They all function differently and they work together to promote our body health or the system health. Another slide, please. 
So based on that, we designed this survey. We ask about the equipment and facility sanitation, their water treatment and employee hygiene, food safety awareness, and also the plant handling. Yeah, next slide, please. And also the um, sampling plan. Would you please click through? And we sampled the fresh produce at multiple points and the nutrient solution at multiple points. And we do the environmental swap, like the farming tools and employee surfaces. Next slide, please. And we bring the samples back to our lab to do the analysis. And click, click, click through. And we have the bacterial enumeration and the score survey. And for the sequencing side, we extract microbial DNA. Would you please close and click through? Extract the bacterial DNA and do the sequencing and bioinformatics analysis. And next slide, please. And here are the outcome we can get from this tool. The first thing, the basic one is how much bacteria are there from the bacterial enumeration, which tells you the general microbial quality in the system. And the second one is how many kinds of bacteria are there via the sequencing and bioinformatics tool. For example, here we know for farm A, the location A, they similar, similar they have like many different kinds of bacteria comparing to other systems. And when we looking back into our survey questions, we know that the employee, they didn't use the protected equipment. They didn't change shoes when coming from outdoor farm to the indoor farm, which may bring in the bacteria. And next page, please. And also we can know what kinds of bacteria are there and their proportion inside the system. For example, on the really right side, the A1 farm, their shoes, we can see they have the proteobacteria from cues as well as the acidobacteria. So there are different kinds of bacteria making up the community. And from the ex exile here, bottom are the different samples. And next slide, please. Here is where we zoom in a little bit to screen for the pathogen hazards as well as the spoilage bacteria. For the pathogen, what we can screen is like the human pathogen, clown pathogen, fish pathogen, which tell us what are the hazards in here to make the system sick. sick. And for the spoilage, is that something this bacteria make your product last shorter and from become bad easily. So these are heat maps and the brighter color here, they are showing um, abundance of these bacteria. For example, we can see the A1 shoes from the both maps. They are having different kinds of spoilage microorganism as well as pathogens. And linking back to the survey, we can do the risk analysis, say you need to change your shoes before coming into the indoor farm. Next page, please. And here's the last step where we are identifying the bacterial transmission inside the system and tell them how to prevent the transmission. And here a tool we use is called South Tracker and it can tell us for our fresh produce product. For example, here are different kinds of lattice. Where do they get different bacteria from? For example, the human shoes, they contribute largely to the microbiome of the fresh produce, as well as the environmental swabs like the trees. And also from the right side, we can see here is they are mm, part of the mm, fresh produce itself. It has its own background bacteria profile, which will also contribute to the environment. So the transmission is in both ways, from the environment to the produce and from the produce to the environment. And next slide, please. So based on that, we can develop a plant or facility specific transmission map. And would you please click through it? It has uh, animation inside. 
So for farm A, we have the main thing is the employee that didn't change the shoes when coming inside the farm and bring in the outside contamination into the farm. And another click, please. And also the bacteria on the fresh produce itself can transmit from one point to another point by the farming practice of the human, of the worker. Also, another click, please. Another click. By the circulating nutrition solution to transmit it inside the system. So here's our main control points. One is the employee itself, the personal hygiene. Another one where we don't know from here, but it can be a possible source is the contaminated seeds as well as the source of water. And another click please. And the circulation inside the system by the human or by the circulating water. And the last slide, please. So here are the take home information. So our tool is like a facility specific. We can do a customized risk analysis for different kind of system and design the questionnaire and design the sampling method. And we don't really need to target specific pathogen hazards. And we can tell, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, we can tell the transmission route and we can tell how to prevent this transmission and control, where to control by this method, as well as our risk assessment is not only focused on the food safety, but also focused on the system health, which really benefit each farm. And that's it. And last slide, please. And thank you. Here's the funding information and our article is published on this link. You can see the full article here. Okay, thank you very much. It's a short presentation. Thank you so much, Mingyi. Um, this, well, we'll go ahead and move on and save our questions for the end. Uh, sure. So uh, next we have Rob from University of California Cooperative Extension. All right, so um, Katie knows I keep a quick pace on the slides. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me. I work with the University of California Cooperative Extension as the Bay Area Urban Ag and Food Systems Advisors. Um, and when folks uh, think about uh, cities, they don't always think about food. Next slide, please. And so our approach is to really work with communities on self-identified issues that community has identified, implement programs, monitor, improve on them, and continue to improve conditions. Okay, this is this is uh, rolling, and I don't know why. Um, so go back. There we go. All right, and uh, ultimately to implement uh, the programs after outreach, sufficient outreach has been done. Um, we're in a place of globalization. Greater than 60% of the world's population will pretty much be living in cities soon. All right. So uh, as we as as we urbanize, we're seeing uh, our food going farther and farther away from us, and hopefully it'll go in the reverse direction. We're seeing reductions in the air and water quality and soil quality. Ultimately, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, and the work that we're doing around this with community uh, falls into a number of themes or buckets. Go ahead. We're developing a train the trainer urban farmer program. I call it the civic urban farmer program. It's very much about giving back to community. We're working with uh, the Ag Marketing Service to uh, review the current development of a, a curriculum that was derived from the promise of urban ag. It's called Realizing the Promise of Urban Agriculture. It's a new curriculum that's going to be implemented and piloted, hopefully in the fall, if all goes well. We are working with uh, staff um, and colleagues to become better at um, community education around food safety, carbon farm planning, and urban soil quality management and developing or working with existing train the trainer uh, modules on that. Next slide, please. 
And I also want to harp on, um, you know, California's food and agricultural policies, uh, because I work in California, but serve as many in the nation as I can. Um, there, there are some innovative uh, pathways being developed through some of the current food policies being implemented. One is uh, micro entrepreneurial home kitchen operations, or I sometimes call them micro kitchens for short. Think about your apartment and the ability for your apartment to be able to be a restaurant. Next slide, please. So some of the other work we're uh, proceeding with is around uh, produce and soil quality and safety uh, after urban floods and fires. Um, we've developed a train the trainer training module uh, for uh, groups like master gardeners or volunteers active with the local resource conservation districts so that they can learn about uh, urban soil management and being able to uh, stay safe when growing food in marginal soils. And we've also done a garlic project where we uh, actually got uh, some, some garlic bulbs uh, grown and sampled. hypothesis. So that was a fun finding. Next slide, please. Um, we're working in partnership now for about six years with the Alameda County Resource Conservation District on uh, administering and co- uh, coordinating the implementation of an urban agriculture mini grants program. Uh, the mini grants program is three to five thousand dollars per year and it's ranged from a maximum total of total bucket funding of 16 to 23,000 a year and uh, the three to five thousand goes to groups that are growing food in community and it's very much uh, modeled off of the USDA Natural Resource Conservation's EQIP grant which is a 50-50 match around conservation practices and measures implemented um, and specifically around irrigation improvements, cover cropping, bioswales, uh, efforts around that. We're developing, next slide please. Um, as part of the Urban Ag Mini Grant Program, we support pollinators, hedgerows, windbreaks, rainwater harvesting opportunities and more composting. Um, and compost systems uh, being installed onto the urban farmer community garden groups. Next slide, please. And when thinking about urban agriculture, it's important that you think about um, how much the land is being developed on. Uh, from 84 into the 2000s, we lost over a million acres uh, in California statewide to urban land uses. Um, and most urban agriculture groups that I work with, um, in many, many cases, they are small food justice organizations trying to grow uh, produce in their communities as a response to food insecurity and long-term historic disinvestment in low-income communities in terms of uh, services and economic growth. Um, and so there are many of them are operating on parks district, school district, utility district, uh, correctional or transportation lands. They're not necessarily operating on um, their on lands that they own themselves as small nonprofits. And in many cases, um, they're growing food not necessarily for production, but for um, equitable distribution of food grown locally as much as possible. Next slide, please. So one of our projects is mapping urban farms and community gardens. This is just one uh, set. It's actually an older image. Um, we're working on mapping them in terms of the kinds of activities they offer in their community, uh, what kinds of produce they grow and or how do they distribute it, uh, what kind of land uh, ownership relationship they have with the agencies or organizations on whose land they may be on. Next slide, please. We're also mapping, eventually hoping to map future potential grower sites and, and add in ecosystem services into all this. So it's a one-stop uh, fits all. And ultimately developing this coupled with our newsletter, coupled with our Bay Area, Bay Area Urban Farming Resources Guide, uh, a resource hub for urban farmers growing community for beyond their own personal or, or family needs. Next slide, please.
next theme in terms of uh, in this work and extension in the nutrition world, folks often refer to uh, work around policy systems and environments. Go back up, please. Um, but here I'm referring to food policy systems and environments. And think about this work in terms of micro farm to fork, small scale growing for community and efforts around food and lands access and security in terms of the long haul. So one of the things we've done is we've worked uh, and collaborated with uh, Oakland Food Policy Council, myself being a non-voting liaison member, uh, but the council ultimately advocated for the right to grow food getting passed in Oakland. In Alameda County, uh, recently the Good Food Purchasing uh, Policy has been passed, which looks to channel on the order of between eight and $22 million of food purchased from uh, by hospital and uh, other medical and correctional facilities um, for their cafeterias for their varying kinds of meals distribution um, and have that, that purchasing be done at the hyperlocal level from urban farmers. Um, we are working with others in a group called Alameda County All In on an effort towards an Alameda County circular food economy. And we're currently in the process of having just established an urban ag committee of the County Agricultural Advisory Committee. Uh, it's a, the urban ag committee is a subcommittee. And ultimately, we're going to be looking at the urban ag policies of all of the county, including all the cities, and trying to improve on them over time. Next and last, well, next theme, please. So just think about urban ag and horticulture in and around cities, in and around urbanization, where we're having more and more impervious services. Uh, these areas of work, including tree stewardship, can support climate solutions and food security that's more integrate, more local, more neighborhood-based. Next slide, please. And then there's the therapeutic side. We're seeing as an emerging theme, um, many folks informally value uh, spending time in open green spaces like urban farms and community gardens. But there are uh, groups around the country that are focusing on horticultural activities uh, as having uh, positive health benefits, positive health potential outcomes in the, in the areas of cognitive, social, emotional, and physical health. Um, this all relates to how we interface with our environment, our own health and well-being as a balance with the ecosystem around us and the stressors thereof. Climate change is one, the pandemic has been another. In the West, we've had a lot of fires and floods, and so they have contributed to um, ecosystem considerations that are stressful as well. Next slide, please. So in wrapping up, right, uh, we're just about done. We're not only creating healthier places to live, but doing our part in improving the environment. And we're doing this by engaging with local neighbors, local community members to transform and green up our spaces. Next slide, please. Are, are we still here? I can't hear. I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> oh, um, did we lose Rob? Mm -hmm. Looks like maybe we so. lost Rob. Okay. Okay. Well, um, unfortunately, um, I haven't been able to watch chat, so I hope everyone has gotten their questions and, yeah, and things answered I'm, in chat. I've been watching. There's not any. Oh. Okay. Pretty much All wrapped right. up. Thanks so much. Oh, sorry, Rob. <laughs> That's okay. That's Does okay. anybody have any off. questions? I don't know why apparently you guys couldn't hear me for a second. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, this is a technology in urban agriculture, and we sure have had some technology issues today um, with this with this open forum. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Rob or Mingi or Nadine or Alyssa, if she's still here? Or anything you want to discuss? 
do you all put your have you all put your contact information in the chat box and um, websites and all of that there is a question in the chat for rob okay would you be willing to share contact information for future questions and conversation Absolutely, working on it right now. Thank you. Okay, upcoming events slide. There we go. So there were two of them. I hope this is um, slide you were requesting. Oops, so yeah. Okay, is there anything else? Any other questions or requests? Okay. Well, thanks to everyone for sticking with us through all of our technical difficulties today. Um, and we appreciate you as always. This is actually, we've had more people today than we haven't had in a while in a, in a one of our open forums. So it tells me that this is a pretty good topic and one we'll probably um, revisit later on because we did have a few people who weren't able to present this time that wanted to. Um, so in the next coming, in the few next months, we'll um, keep you updated on that. So thank you again. And I hope everyone has a wonderful summer and a good rest of your day. Well, I have a chat. Okay. Good. Um, go ahead, Matt, if you want to um, mention that. Oh, yes. I think I, no, I think I did. Let's see. Um, I have to look back at my notes. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Irwin is one of the editors on the um, call for articles for the Frontiers in Sustainable Food Systems. Um, if there's another event besides that, Matt, I'm not sure. Okay, <laughs> good. Okay.